Welcome to the MTA Podcast Series, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with recognized industry professionals, and your host, Ed Carlson. Tuesday, April 13th, 2010. Today's guest has been called the world's leading authority on RSI, or Relative Strength Index. It's Andrew Cardwell. Andrew Cardwell began his trading career in 1978 as a sales representative and broker with McCormick Commodities. In 1981, he left the broker's business to devote his time to the study of technical analysis and develop a trading program and model around the Relative Strength Index. After leaving the brokerage business, he started offering his RSI-based market opinions to individuals, small brokerage companies, and investment firms, and developed his own RSI course series, which he has offered to the trading public over the last 20 years. Andrew has developed through pattern recognition what he called his RSI range rules, and also the Cardwell positive and negative reversal patterns. These reversal patterns help to identify when a market is about to undergo a trend change. The most dynamic aspect of the positive and negative reversals is their inherent ability to target and forecast future price objectives in the direction of the new emerging trend. Andrew Cardwell has taught his proprietary RSI Basic and RSI Edge courses to individual traders, brokers, money managers, and technical analysts from around the globe. He has provided weekly market commentary for the Financial News Network and CNBC. His articles and interviews have been published in magazines and by news services and other publications worldwide. Andrew Cardwell, welcome to the program. Good to be with you, Ed. We're delighted to have you. I understand you are on a beach in South Carolina, is it? Well, I live in Atlanta, originally from Philadelphia, and I moved to Atlanta in 81, or in the early 80s. And uh, my parents live out on the coast in South Carolina, so it's nice to get out of the hustle and bustle of the city and just listen to the ocean, the seagulls, and play a little golf. <laughs> oh, you're killing me. <laughs> and like, like a lot of us, you started your career as a broker. How was it that you came to discover technical analysis and the RSI in particular? Well, I started off as a sales rep where I was basically raising money for one of the uh, fund managers that we had at the firm, which was McCormick Commodities out of Chicago. And while I was marketing someone else's money management program, I got to meet the actual money manager. And he was in Atlanta for a few days, and all the brokers were asking him what he thought about different markets and what was his opinion on this trade or that trade. And I didn't really ask anything the whole day he was there. And then uh-huh. when everybody left, everybody left the office, you know, to go have a drink. And he was waiting for my boss. And I asked him, I said, I just want to ask one question. He said, what's that? I said, is it closed price based? And do you use moving averages? And he said, yes. I said, well, thank you. He said, that's it? I said, pretty much. I said, you're a physician trader. You're not in and out of the markets every day. He said, no, I try and identify a trend and, and get on early and stay with me. That got me started. I started thinking about why do markets move the way they do. I was an economics major in school and learned all about supply and demand, but I said, there's got to be more to it. So I started watching charts and watching reactions to news, and I was very, very fortunate because a lot of people search for a long time to find what their type of analysis is going to be, their approach to markets. Right. And my, my boss had a client who was doing very well. He shared with me an article from back then it was called Commodities Magazine, uh, now called Futures, and they had an interview with Wells Wilder in the magazine about his relative strength index. Uh-huh. So I saw this fellow do very well, and I said, well, there's got to be something to it. And this was long before computers. This was 1978. So I took out the worksheet that was in the magazine and made copies of the worksheet, got a copy of Wells' original book, New Concepts in Technical Analysis, and started reading different aspects, different chapters, each on individual uh, technical tools. I really honed in on the RSI. And I took my worksheets, and every day I took the closing price, and with a calculator, calculated the next day's RSI value, and 
usually everybody would leave the office at four, and I'd pull out the calculator and the worksheets and the graph paper and start plotting everything by hand. Hmm. And to this day, I still plot daily by hand that I follow by hand. Wow! Take the value off the computer and just plot the uh, data points. Wow! And I started wow. recognizing different ranges when markets were in uptrends. How it wasn't just seventy and thirty, and adjusted the range for bullish and bearish, huh? and developed the range rules for trend. And then I started recognizing these certain patterns. Everybody was selling when they saw bearish divergence and buying when they saw bullish divergence. So I started with different markets. Back then it was cattle and hogs and soybeans, and then I got into gold, silver, the currencies. And back in 78, we had the bull market in gold. Gold went up to 875 and silver went up over $50. But everybody said it was too high when the RSI hit 70, and I saw the RSI go to 90. Every time it corrected, it was a short one- or two-day correction. The RSI fell dramatically with a small move in price, and I started noticing the difference between where, where the bottoms or the oversold levels and uh -huh. started taking the difference to uh, calculate an upside target, which I called my positive reversal. So I did the same thing when I saw something in reverse and the range had shifted from being on the upside or upper half of the chart to the lower half and recognized bear markets. So way back in 78, even without a computer, I wasn't using moving averages or anything, just plotting daily values. Now, while you were doing all that, were you still working as a broker? Well, I had a smile and dial as a broker during the day to keep my boss, my boss happy. Uh huh. And when they all left the office about 4.30 in the afternoon, I'd pull out the graph paper and the charts and get the closing prices off the quote machine. Right. And just calculate all the RSI values until usually I was in the office till 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. Well, how was it you finally became so convinced in the power of this indicator or technical analysis in general that you were willing to give up your position with McCormick Commodities? Because I started noticing that my opinions were vastly different from the brokerage firm. <laughs> <laughs> and where my boss said, get on the phone and smile and dial. And uh -huh. I said, well, I said, I can't. And I was also a broker. I mean, there were some clients that would call in and ask for market opinions. And I would give them an opinion based on what I saw in the RSI. Sure. And, and it got to a point where... The boss said, well, that's not the house opinion. So I'd have to talk to Mr. Smith on the phone and say, Mr. Smith, our house opinion and firm opinion is the following. He said, well, I, I, fine. Tell me what you think based on your chart patterns. Yeah, yeah. How, well, so how long said, was it before you were able to develop your business that, you're, you, know, that you're, you, you struck out on and, or struck out with, not struck out? And, and how did you go about that? How did you make the transition? Well, I actually uh, started in the business in May of 78, started working with the RSI article. It was about a month or so later. It was the June issue. And in 1980, okay. uh, I left, uh, 80, 81, I left the brokerage business and went out and started a little newsletter that we called the Philadelphia Advisor and started sharing my opinions in a weekly newsletter, which we typed up, printed out, and mailed out. This is before everything was going to email, zap, right. mail, and whatever. Right. And I had forwarded it off to uh, different people. Uh, one was Ed Hart out at Financial News Network years ago. Uh. And he mentioned it on air, and people started to write it to me, and then they called, and I started doing a comment. I did an in a live show with them. I flew out to L.A. called Money Talk, and I was on for about 30 minutes. And I think the second time I was out there, uh, John Bollinger sat in on the interview. And the person that was doing the interview, she referred to me as Andrew. And John said, well, we ought to just call him Dr. RSI. And that <laughs> name that John gave me stayed with me forever. Uh-huh. But it was from there I got asked to speak at different conferences and... From the conferences, people were always asking me. I was doing a one-hour or two-hour workshop 
They said, you have more. So that evolved into the courses. Uh -huh. And then I started teaching the weekend courses. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get back into the RSI in a little more depth in a moment. But uh, before we do, you know, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, John Bollinger referred to you as Mister RSI. I did want to ask, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but do you have any other favorite indicators? Any anything else that you uh, kind of keep in your back pocket, keep track of, uh, in addition to the RSI? Well, I'm a technician. I believe, as I've taught my horses, that markets basically fall into four categories. Price, momentum, time, and sentiment. I call it primotus. And I guess the reason I stayed with the RSI so strongly and believed in it so much is it incorporated all four of those key points. I could see the price change. I could see the rate at which prices were changing. I could count the number of periods and really use the RSI as a sentiment tool as well. So I'll follow market sentiment, and I'll follow volume in the sense of if price goes up, volume goes with it. But basically, you know, where I started was just graphing and looking at bar charts. And I looked at other tools. I looked at MACD. I looked at rate of change. I, I took a look at Elliott Wave. But I primarily stayed where I was, and... I had a uh, conference I had gone to in Vegas, and one of the other speakers was George Lane, from the father of stochastics. And I got up one morning and went down to the restaurant, and I saw George. And we sat and talked through breakfast, and I asked him, I said, if you had it to do all over again, what would you do? He said, I would do exactly what you did. Take one indicator, learn it inside out, upside down, forward, backwards, know when it's performing normally, know when it's performing a little out of sync, and then follow about five markets and learn their personalities. So I guess when I took that and then started following gold, silver, the currencies, the interest rates, and commodities, I started to realize what type of patterns they had. But pretty much, time frame-wise, I stayed with the daily charts because at the time I first started, I didn't have a computer to do intraday. Right and all right. followed all different markets and found that the patterns were the same, the projections as far as the positive and negative and the range rules, they all stayed the same no matter what market it was. And I got my first computer in 88, 10 years later. And it was like a godsend because it I'll did bet. moving averages. And, and then I looked at hourly charts and five-minute charts and nothing seemed to change as far as the guidelines I had for range mm -hmm. rules and counting the patterns and projecting the prices, whether it was a five-minute chart or a weekly chart. Yeah. Andrew, I've got to jump in here. Uh, we're going to continue with Andrew Cardwell in a moment, but first a reminder that on next week's program, we'll have from Stadium Money Management, Greg Morris. Andrew, we, we have a, a new file here at the uh, podcast series we call Communication with Clients. Uh, you mentioned a newsletter. Um, do you still use a newsletter to communicate with your customers, or do you, in the tight tech age, do you use other mediums? Uh, the newsletter, you know, I'll write commentaries and send them out to clients. I do a lot of consulting work, which is one-on-one. -on -one. I'd rather be on the phone with somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as a client to explain a market or if they have an opinion. I also, you know, do webinars for different companies where we'll go over market conditions and different market opinions. Uh, the bullbear.com, uh, I do, from time to time I'll do a, like a teaching session on there or just a market commentary session. But most of the time, you know, I can co communicate with clients through email and writing out a commentary and send it to them. The uh, webinars I've done, you know, I try and post on my website so that if somebody wants to find me, they can go to cardwellrsiedge.com. It has all the course information, any interviews I've done, any webinars I've done. And then that way if they want to learn, it's all there. Because I had somebody help me out. Trading is the hardest way to an easy living especially <laughs> when you don't know what you're doing. The hardest way to and, easy living. Uh-huh. 
Well, let's and talk I about my- uh, some of those ways to an easy living. I, I, we mentioned in the introduction your RSI range rules and the Cardwell positive negative reversal patterns. And I, I was uh, very intrigued by these. You, you mentioned that uh, they not only identify when a market is about to undergo, undergo a trend change, but they also have the ability to target and forecast future price objectives. Can you uh, uh, fill us in on, on what you're doing here? Well, as I said, you know, most people look at the RSI as an overbought, oversold indicator. They figure you sell, it's overbought at 70 and it's oversold at 30. Mm-hmm. Markets that are in uptrends tend to stay overbought. Bearish divergence that forms on an RSI chart is not a reversal signal. It's just showing that the market is overextended to the upside. The market will correct, the RSI will come down. And the RSI will hit a lower level than it did before, but the price will be higher, which is the basic concept of drawing a trend line. A higher bottom, you draw a trend line, and the market should stay above it. With a bullish divergence, you get oversold, the price goes lower, but the RSI is greater, and everybody says, oh, that's a bull divergence. No, the market is then overextended to the downside. It will rally to correct that oversold, but it will rally to a level that is higher than it was before in terms of RSI, but the price is lower. So we take the difference and subtract it off the last low as a tar- setting a new objective on the downside. Mm-hmm. Now, when a market is in an uptrend, you will get overbought. You will see bearish divergence. Everybody gets excited, but people are by nature bullish, and this was the basis for the range rules. The market doesn't stop at 70. It can go to 80. It can go to 85. I saw RSI readings uh, back in the 80s, early 80s, on gold and silver that were hitting 90 to 95. What what length of RSI are you using? How many days? Is this the 14-day? Standard 14-period RSI on the daily chart, the hourly 15, 5-minute. I don't change the time period. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to use a 7 or 9. Well, if you're going to use seven or nine periods, you're going to see the RSI go to 90 on a regular basis. But the 14 period seemed to be, it was what Wells started with. Uh, it's what I did all my original work on, and then I started looking at seven and nine and 20 days for stocks and 25 days for currencies. But the standard 14 period is the one, to me, that showed the clearest, cleanest patterns it didn't matter which market it was, and it didn't matter what time frame it was, whether it was a 10-minute chart, an hourly, or a daily. But I have rules and guidelines. If a market's in an uptrend, it should be in the upper half of the chart in this 80 to 40 range. So I adjusted the upside by 10, and I increased the downside by 10 to keep that same 40 points. And if the RSI stays between 80 and 40, the trend should be up. When it breaks to the downside and cannot get back up above 60, then I look at the 60 and 20 range for overbought and oversold. If we're in an uptrend, 80 and 40, downtrend, 60 and 20, but we should also see these positive reversal patterns show up in the 80-40 range, and if it's in a downtrend, we'll see the negative patterns. Got it. Then I look at moving averages on the RSI as well. Oh, you do? Andrew, in the two minutes we've got left at most, um, what, let's talk about the current markets. Um, what keeps you up at night? Uh, where, where do you think these markets are headed? Nothing. <laughs> nothing, keeps, nothing keeps me up at night as long as I'm in tune with the trend, but I've taught my students also uh, to trade as if it's not money. To trade like you have ice water in your veins, you're following a line up and down on a chart. You look for certain patterns. As long as you're seeing those patterns, the trend should be up. Stock market's been up since March. It's been in that range. It's been in the upper half of the chart. We've seen positive reversals. We've hit the targets, and we hit those targets and clear it. Now, I have my own RSI, which I have based on the original RSI, which we originally called the DFG Momentum Oscillator for Cardwell Financial Group. 
and it's a little bit more sensitive. It'll go some turns faster. Uh, this all my work was copyrighted back in the early nineties, and my positive reversal, negative reversals, my CFG. There's some people out there, and to be honest with you, if plagiarism is the highest form of flattery. Well, sure. Because they've take, taken some of my work and claimed it as their own just by naming it uh, momentum, divers- uh, momentum Discrepancy Reversal Points. It was easier to say a positive reversal. <laughs> uh, CFG, somebody's referred to my CFG as the composite index. No, that's my original work from the late 80s, early 90s that I had copyrighted. Uh-huh. And, it, you know, I guess if you ask something at work, somebody wants to have a part of it. But, you know, I don't cry over spilled milk. I don't worry about other people. I help students and I help traders learn how to identify a trend, a trend change, and be able to price forecast. And in all the years I've taught, I can still talk to the people who took my courses 20 years ago. Because seventy percent of my course students have been referral, and I've got students in twenty eight countries. Huh. If I get an email, somebody asks me to look at a particular market or take a look at the trade they're considering, and we're actually talking in the same language. So when it comes to markets and what keeps me awake at night, there's nothing really that bothers me when I'm trading because of the fact I've cross my T's, I go down a checklist, I understand the risk management is more important than, than profits. Profits will take care of themselves if you manage your risk properly, uh-huh. but identify risk, reward, and probability, and that's what I found in RSI. Oh, that's I great. was long gold, I was long gold from 07, uh, fall of 07, we saw the stock market topping out, we got out of the stocks for clients, we were buying gold. I'm starting to buy gold again because I still think gold's headed to 13 and 1500. Mm-hmm. The stock market looks a little toppy. We were short dollars going into the spring and saw a correction developing, and so far it's still in that uptrend technically, but it's very overextended now and could undergo a, a good size correction. Uh, we're short the euro. And it got a little oversold and has had a bounce, but I haven't seen a trend change yet. Oil, we're still very positive on. I think you're going to see crude oil go up over $100 a barrel. Uh-huh. Uh, some commodities are coming back to life. The hogs and cattle have had a nice run. Interest rates, I think, are going up. We started shorting the bond futures up around the 119, 120 level. And I think you see bond, 30-year bond futures base, uh, say June, get under 115, go down to about 112, and eventually mm-hmm. under 110. Because I think the market itself is correcting, even though the Fed is not really raising interest rates. So we've yeah. got some interesting markets. Mm-hmm. Very interesting Andrew, markets. We are, we are more than out of time at this point. In- and it's just been great having you with us today. I, I, I can almost see you out there on the beach in South Carolina. Before we go... Well, you'll be seeing me on the golf course this afternoon. Yeah. Before we go, and just very quickly, is there anything else you'd like to mention? No, nah, it's not so much a parting shot. It's just that if people want to get a hold of me, we're here to help. Uh, I've been doing it a long time, and even when I was coaching my son's Little League team, I taught the kids. <laughs> the better you learn to play a game, the more you will enjoy the game. And there you the same go. in trading. There you go. That's a great and way to eighty percent. It's eighty percent mental and twenty percent mechanical. Eighty percent mental, twenty percent mechanical. All right. Well, that wraps up today's MTA podcast from Seattle. I'm Ed Carlson. You can follow me at SeattleTechnicalAdvisors.com or contact me at Ed at SeattleTechnicalAdvisors.com. Send us your comments and suggestions. Let's keep our stuff tight. Good day.